Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, you If you're trying to prove something in a court of law, the testimony of a witness given under oath can be critical evidence to support your case. And the best kind of witness to have in this scenario is a percipient witness. The word percipient meaning having a good understanding of things. And a percipient witness is one who can testify about things that they actually saw, heard, or otherwise experienced. A percipient witness, also sometimes called an eyewitness, can make or break a case, assuming that they are credible and believable in their testimony, that they have their facts straight, and that it can be verified that they're telling the truth. Witness testimony can be vitally important to proving a case, but it can also be slippery. Because as people, we're inherently skeptical. We have to be convinced. And in a court of law, there is a burden of proof placed on the one who is bringing the case. The opposing side will try to poke holes in the testimony of a witness. Are they sure they saw what they said they saw? How close were they to the event in question? Was there something blocking or obscuring their view, keeping them from seeing clearly? Are we sure that we should believe this person? In Luke and Acts, the gospel writer is making their case for the resurrection of Jesus by providing witnesses to these events. After the disciples meet Jesus on the road to Emmaus, and he appears to Simon Peter, and then again to all the disciples in Jerusalem, 
The risen Christ explains how his death and resurrection is a fulfillment of the scriptures and the prophecies of their faith. And then Jesus says to them, you are witnesses to these things. Later in Acts, after Peter and John heal a man who has been lame his entire life, and as now walking around and praising God, the apostles tell the astonished crowd that the healing came not from them, but from God, who also raised Jesus from the dead. To this we are witnesses, they say. And because they are witnesses, they now have the power to do this miraculous healing. These disciples are not just witnesses. They are precipient witnesses. They were there. They saw that Jesus had been arrested and killed. They saw that the stone had been rolled away and that the tomb was empty. They saw Jesus risen, too. They talked with him and ate with him and touched his wounds. He was not a ghost or a figment of their imagination, but real and alive. They saw it experienced it. The gospel writers really want us to believe this story. And so they have presented their most credible, most reliable and trustworthy, their precipient witnesses to the death and resurrection, to tell the story of what they have seen and heard and experienced firsthand. The Gospel writers give multiple accounts and great detail of these events because they know that what they are trying to convince the world of is pretty unbelievable. A man died and was brought back to life? He was eating fish and bread and talking and walking? Yeah, I don't know about that. And we have a right to be skeptical, don't we? Because death, death we understand. Suffering and grief and loss, those are real and familiar. But resurrection? Life that triumphs over death, that's a lot harder to believe in. This week, as yet another black man was killed in Minneapolis, Dante Wright killed by police officers at a traffic stop simply for having air fresheners hanging in his rearview mirror. And video footage was released of the police killing of Adam Toledo, a 13-year-old Latinx boy in Chicago. Yeah, we believe in death. As the trial of Derek Chauvin continues and the defense emphasized George Floyd's drug use, his criminal record, his underlying health concerns, his intimidating size as factors leading to his death rather than the police officer's knee on his neck. We believe in death. As students return to in-person school and once again have to face the real possibility of school shootings, like the one that happened in Tennessee this week. We believe in death. As Asian Americans continue to be targeted for hate crimes and violence, as people continue to die from COVID-19 here and around the world, as our military withdraws from the longest war we have ever been a part of in Afghanistan, leaving that country ravaged, we believe in death. It's not that we don't want to believe in life with all its liberating possibilities and beautiful wonders. We want to believe in a God who triumphs over the grave, who can raise a human being from the dead and in miraculous, life-altering healings of broken people. But there's so much evidence to the contrary. We're understandably dubious. 
even with the compelling testimony of these firsthand biblical witnesses, even if we believe that it happened once upon a time for Jesus, it can be hard for us to see the evidence of the living God in our time and place. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Can I get a witness? But looking again at these accounts from the scriptures, we can take comfort in the fact that the disciples, who would be the primary witnesses of the resurrection, didn't see it at first either. They were so paralyzed by their fear, overcome by their grief, that they didn't even recognize Jesus when he was walking and talking with them. When he appeared among them, they thought he was a stranger or even a ghost. But then it was in the ordinary things of life, like breaking bread together, and in the comforting practices of their faith, like offering hospitality to a stranger, that they witnessed the resurrection, that they recognized the living Christ in their midst, it was then that they realized that Jesus had been with them on the road all along, that he had entered into grief with them and walked with them in their pain. Their hearts were suddenly burning with love and God's mercy, and they saw in a new light that God was bringing life out of death. You see, even when we are witnesses to something, we might not recognize it at first for what it is or what it could be. Sometimes our biases or our assumptions, our preconceived notions can get in the way of the awareness of the truth of something that's right in front of us. Our fear can blind us to what's really happening. Do you know what I'm talking about? Can I get a witness? Reverend Dr. Ron Bell, who is a United Methodist pastor in Minneapolis, who's an important part of his ministry is working to destigmatize therapy and mental health in the black community, acknowledges that healing comes in many ways for people. It doesn't look the same for all of us. In response to the protests that took place this summer after the death of George Floyd and since then because of the ongoing violence and injustice for black people, this is what Reverend Bell wrote. I think you were so busy looking for a riot that you missed the gathering of the grieving. I think you were so busy looking for looters that you missed the lament and heartbreak of a community. I think you were so busy looking for trouble that you missed the tragedy of systemic racialized trauma on the bodies of black and brown people. Tonight, tomorrow, and even the next day, I beg of you, look again, look again. Can Reverend Bell get a witness because once we look I mean really look once we become witnesses our eyes and hearts are opened to where God is at work once our hearts are on fire for the ways in which God is bringing healing out of pain and hope out of suffering and justice out of oppression we're changed we cannot unsee it or unfeel it. We become witnesses. And to be a witness asks more of us than just seeing or experiencing something. That's just an observer. But God calls us to be witnesses. People who see and who tell others what they have seen. People who are so changed by what we have experienced that we have to testify with our words, our actions, 
our very lives. On May 25th, 2020, 17-year-old Darnella Frazier and her nine-year-old cousin went to Cup Foods convenience store in Minneapolis to get some snacks. It was there on the street that Darnella witnessed a white police officer kneeling on the neck of an unarmed black man. She took out her cell phone and started recording as the man was crying out that he was in pain, that he couldn't breathe, lamenting for his mother. And he eventually stopped breathing. Ms. Frazier shared the video on social media and it went viral, igniting protests over racism and police abuse around the world. In her testimony in the trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin, this is what she said about what she witnessed and how that experience affected her. It's been nights I stayed up apologizing and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life. But it's not what I should have done. It's what he, Derek Chauvin, should have done. Can Darnella Frazier get a witness? Because of her courage, because Darnella Frazier had the foresight to videotape this incident and share it on social media, because she served as a witness to George Floyd's death, she has made us all witnesses to. Because of her witness, there is now a chance for there to be accountability in the death of George Floyd. But for real change to take place in systems of oppression, it will require more people who are willing to be witnesses, who are willing to call us to action and to account. When Peter and John healed the man who had been lame from birth, Everyone in the temple that day wanted to know, how did this happen? Who healed this man? And Peter tells them, it wasn't us. It was God. The living God. We're just witnesses. But Peter also tells them that they were wrong. And that they need to change. That out of their ignorance and fear and prejudice, an innocent man died. Repent, therefore, Peter says, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, so that you too might be witnesses to the power of the living God. Can I get a witness? Because when our eyes and our hearts are open, when we're really willing to see and be changed, when we become witnesses, the power of the living God can work in and through us. We're not just passive believers in the power of the resurrection. No, we are agents of God's power, of God's power of life in this world. And we are fully alive. And sin and death will lose their power over us, over others, and over this world. Kai Shapley is a fourth grader in Texas. She loves ballet, math, science, and geology. She spends her free time with her cats and her chickens and FaceTiming her friends and dreaming of meeting Dolly Parton. And Kai is also transgender. As many of you are already aware, right now there are hundreds of bills making their way through state legislatures. Bills that target transgender people and specifically transgender kids and their families. These bills would prevent trans girls from playing sports, 
prevent transgender people from accessing health care, and would criminalize gender-affirming care for minors. Right now, there's a bill in Texas that would label parents who support their child's gender transition as abusers. It's horrible and horrifying. But this week, Kai was a witness. She was a witness to those lawmakers, a witness to what it means to speak your truth in the faith, face of death-dealing powers and to call others to repentance and change. In response to a legislator who evoked the book of Genesis, saying that going outside of God's original design of creation would cause us to suffer the same sin as those who were cast out of the garden, Kai responded with her truth. God made me. God loves me for who I am, and God doesn't make mistakes. Can Kai get a witness, y'all? So where is God calling, calling you to tell your truth? How has the living God set you free, turned your life around, changed your heart and mind, and given you a new understanding? Can you be a witness to that life-changing power for others? God is asking, calling, can I get a witness? May it be so. Amen.